Well, hi, everyone. Uh, you see our title here. Here is the uh, disclaimer, typical disclaimer. I, I, I want to add something to this. Uh, we're going to be talking about legal concepts. We're going to be giving you something to ponder in terms of legal concepts. But in no way is this legal advice. The attorneys would shoot me if I didn't say that. OK, so our situation. We will actually lay our scene, which is what I'm doing now, and follow with a call to order. OK? And then there'll be fact and expert, expert testimony driven by the attorneys. They'll end with a legal argument. Then our judge will designate you as law clerks and will ask you to come to the microphone and say how you would rule. It's not a question period. You want to question us, gather us in the, audio, in the, in the hallway. State how you would rule and why. That's what we're looking for in terms of doing that. And then she will finally make her decision and commentary, explain why she did what she did. So here's the background. There's a company called Dolls R Us. They make dolls. They're a publicly traded company. And they make dolls and all the accoutrements and so forth. And they're a very sophisticated company. They've had some problems with third parties and so forth. So they, they're in front, up in front in terms of trying to secure their product. And they decide that they're going to be moved to this new concept called deception. OK? And in doing so, they take and create an entire zone with servers and everything else, firewalls, things you would see in a normal network, segmented off, totally, totally segmented off from the real world of Dolls R Us in terms of doing this stuff. And then they create a bunch of documents, trading plans, uh, uh, building plans, uh, financial statements, anything that looks attractive. And, and they try to keep them fresh. They act, dates change on, metadata changes, make it do it. And, and they locate them in this set of sacrificial servers that they've set up, okay? And then they secure it. They just don't secure it very well, okay? It looks secure, but there might be a few flaws here and there. And then we have an attacker. This hacker comes in, and he breaks in, and he says, wow, this was really easy, right? And then he finds this document, and he finds a bunch of documents, troves. And in preparation for work, he... He, he moves these out to his own, uh, his own, his own storage area in, in the dark web. Now, let's go to this girl named Susie Bingham. She's, she's 13 years old. She's a student at Nevermore Academy. She, she basically, it's a very advanced curriculum and so forth. She's very bright. She's on a scholarship. And she's taking all this computer stuff, and they're very, very good in school. And one of the things they're doing is they're teaching them about the, the dark web not to make them hackers. They're basically wanting to make them knowledgeable. And she actually gets permission and guidance and so forth in doing a school paper on looking at the kinds of things that are in the dark web, obviously a, a avoiding pornography, but what kind of businesses have information out there and do they know they have them out there? And, and she stumbles across this little area and she finds this document. She's a 13-year-old girl, right? hey, that seems kind of interesting. And although she's been told that she's not supposed to launch programs, she, she, it's honor code, you're not, supposed to, you're not supposed to bring any applications in, you're not supposed to open any documents from the web, she says, hey, well, this is curious. And she goes, ooh. And she brings it over and she opens it. And what she doesn't know, that this deceptive document that was built by Dolls R Us contains semaphores, that the minute she opens them, signals are sent out, basically. And we reach this situation. Dolls R Us receives signals indicating that the bait documents have been opened. They're a publicly traded company. They have been attacked. Even though it's a deception, they've been attacked. They've been in contact with the law enforcement. They're required to do this kind of stuff, right? And so they inform law, law enforcement that this document's been opened, the IP and all this other good stuff. And Nevermore Academy is raided. What a shock. Law enforcement shows up. OK. so. Susie's reputation is a bit sullied here. She's expelled because she violated the honor code, and she loses her scholarship. Susie's parents does the normal thing. They sue, and they're going to sue Dolls R Us because they're claiming that there was an attractive nuisance that made her, that made her do this, right? And Dolls R Us is liable to us. And so in 24 April 2023, which I think might be today, in the Moscone Federal Court, which I think might be here, we have Judge Laura Beeler, who is sitting by appointment. We have Kristen Madigan, Esquire, who's going to be the retained counsel for Susie Bingham. We have Stephen Tepler, who is a retained counsel for Dolls R Us. 
We have Stanley Barr, who is acting as an expert witness in this area. And we have me, Hoyt Kesterson, who's the VP of Information Services, who of course is responsible for putting all this stuff out there, and who is of course acting as your Greek quarters. And we go on. Okay, good. All right, so uh, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, Council. Um, uh, I'm just gonna give you a brief statement of the case and let you all know what the standard is, and I'll remind you of it at the end. As Hoyt just said, um, this is a case where a 13-year-old plaintiff, Susie, is suing Dolls R Us for negligence after downloading a, a document that was Dolls R Us's bait for attackers, resulting in her expulsion from school. So that's what it is, and the issue is negligence. And negligence, just so you can think about it, because I'll be calling on you at the end to share your views about whether, um, this, uh, whether Dolls R Us is responsible for Susie's expulsion. Um, negligence means that somebody was negligent, and I'll tell you what that means in a minute, that someone was harmed, here's Susie, and that Dolls R Us's negligence was a substantial cause of the harm to Susie. And negligence is the failure to use reasonable care to prevent harm to oneself or to others. We'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. The way we're going to proceed today is that we're going to have uh, brief openings by counsel. There, there are going to be two witnesses, as Hoyt said. Uh, Ms. Madigan, you're going to go first with your opening. Are you ready to begin? Yes. All right, It'll just be a couple minutes for an opening and about uh, 12 minutes per witness, or maybe 12 minutes in all. All right, so Ms. Madigan, the floor is yours to open. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I represent 13-year-old scholarship student Susie Bingham, and I would like to tell you our side of the story. As you've heard, Susie was a hardworking student doing research for a school paper, and in doing so, she happened upon a document. She didn't appreciate that the document was a hoax, a marketing and production plan for a product, dolls. She didn't know that document was intended to attract malicious threat actors, and so she innocently downloaded the document to her school account, and that single click of a button triggered a chain of events that led us to why we're here today. There's a concept in law called an attractive nuisance, and, and what that means is if you are a property owner, you bear responsibility to ensure that your property is safe. Think of, for example, swimming pools. And if a reasonably foreseeable accident occurs, you bear some responsibility. The evidence you will hear today will show that Dolls R Us fail to take basic minimum precautions in order to avoid the kind of harm that led to Susie being expelled. First, you're going to hear from our expert, Mr. Stanley Barr, a recognized expert in the world of cybersecurity methods and deployment. He will describe the standard of care for this particular type of deception that was used for cybersecurity purposes, and he will also tell you his opinion that Dolls RS standard of care fell below the standard of care. They didn't take reasonable precautions to prevent the kind of harm we're discussing today. Next, you'll hear from Dolls R Us VP of Information Services, Mr. Hoyt Kesterson. He will tell you the doll plan had to be realistic in order to be effective, and it's not the company's fault. He will tell you that the, company, the document was never intended to go into the public domain, and so if it contains false statements, that's no problem on the part of a publicly traded company. Last, he will try to shift the blame to my client, Susie, and say it was her fault. Those are distractions. Don't fall for it. The company was on notice, and they should have taken more, more steps to prevent the kind of harm that we're here today. It was reasonably foreseeable, and Dolls R Us should be held accountable. Thank you. All right. Uh, Mr. Tepler, are you ready to make a brief opening statement? Yes. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. I represent Dolls R Us, and we're here today to um, discuss and show you, demonstrate, why the steps that Dolls R Us took to protect its own intellectual property were both proper and reasonable. We have, uh, in essence, a, a plaintiff here, a child who is a technologically sophisticated child prodigy who, working against the, her school's own prohibitions, direct prohibitions, meaning that she was on notice that she should not go trawling around the dark net, 
and um, why, she sh why my client should be held accountable for the actions of a child who decides to undertake a dangerous endeavor um, against her school regulations for which she was amply warned. And um, by the way, um, the information was never taken from my client, from Dolls R Us, it was taken from somewhere else on the dark web. And there is no way that there can be any liability attributed to my client for taking the steps it needed to take to protect its own intellectual property and the fact that um, this child who was very, very sophisticated in doing research in cybersecurity and trawling around the dark net should um, be rewarded for taking the actions she was prohibited from doing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tepler. All right, Ms. Madigan, ready to call your first witness? Yes, Your Honor. The witnesses have been previously sworn and have, ag have agreed to tell the truth. Um, and you are calling? Uh, Mr. Mr. Barr. All right, All right. You, may, you may proceed. Good morning, Mr. Barr. Could you please introduce yourself to the jury? I'm Dr. Stanley Barr, and I work at the MITRE Corporation. May I call you Dr. Barr? Sure. Dr. Barr, you me Stan. Dr. <laughs> Dr. Barr, what are you an expert in? So I'm an expert in deception and adversary engagement, and I'm going to tell the truth, even though I, 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 I lie previously, professionally. Previously, 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 <laughs> previously been sworn. <laughs> and Dr. Barr, what is your expertise in deception and adversary engagement based on? So uh, I have worked at the MITRE Corporation for the last 13 years doing uh, cyber deception and adversary engagement operations to learn about uh, nation state actors, how they operate, and how to put them at a disadvantage when they try and uh, uh, operate on, on uh, our networks. Dr. Barr, can you please describe for the jury what is adversary engagement or tainting? So adversary engagement is, is a, a concept, and it involves uh, a set of planning activities, execution activities, and analysis activities. Analysis activities. And the, the types of things we do is the first thing we do is we deny adversaries access to certain things that they, we do not want them to understand or find or realize. And we give them something to do and something to operate on. We deceive them so that they take data that doesn't hurt us and makes them feel successful. So we push our adversaries away from the places we don't want them. We invite them in to the places we do want them. And that allows them to feel like they're getting some successes and they're not stealing and uh, accessing our real data. And Dr. Barr, in the use of adversary engagement, is it common to put into the false document a tracker or a beacon? And why would you do that? Yeah, so sorry about that in the last one. Yeah, so um, the idea is that there are many techniques that you can use uh, and put in information that when someone opens a document uh, on their network or, or accesses it from your, from your site, um, it will send a message to a server someplace out on the internet. And that allows the, um, the person who put that unique identifier in that document to say that document right here, this specific document, um, was referenced at this time and from this IP address. And so it is a, it is a, it is a common, it is a, uh, there are several academic papers on it about this technique as a, as a useful tool. And I believe it's a very useful tool. Dr. Barr, in your experience, what are the minimum steps a company should take to ensure they don't accidentally cause harm when using deception techniques that you've described? Yeah, so there are, there are a number of these, right? So um, I'll, I'll say that first thing you need to make sure is that when you do these types of things, you don't fool your own employees. If you're going to put a piece of uh, documentation that's fake on your own network, you don't want your, your own users to access that and, and do something dumb with it or inappropriate or whatever or make mistakes. So there's a part of making sure that you never fool your own people. And usually the way when I think about this, when I talk to organizations to do this, we say, Put this in a place where no one should legitimately touch it, like my personal tax returns. No, and we all know that if there's a if there's a directory on someone's full uh, somebody else's computer said my personal tax returns, something like that. You never go in there. That's inappropriate, right? That's that's just wrong. So we make sure that it is uh, somehow available for someone to take, but we put it in a place where um, usually we don't have a lot of other real information. Um, and that it should be somewhat 
difficult for uh, another person to have access to it. And I think another thing we always do is you should never put in there things that might be dangerous. Like, uh, I'll just say example, like uh, never show that like, uh, that say that the flammable symbol is, you know, means something different. Like, oh, if it says 444, it's fine, you know, put it in your car, right? You wanna make sure that any sort of trusted things that human beings might rely on that they read in that uh, is not dangerous to them. So it's, it's the idea of making sure that whatever you do is safe, uh, it is isolated, it is relatively unavailable, but to someone who is persistent and, and interested, they will find it and they will take advantage of it. Now, Dr. Barr, you have analyzed Dolls R Us use of adversary engagement at issue in this case. In your opinion, did Dolls R Us take reasonable precautions to prevent harm to my client, Susie Bingham? I don't believe so, right? So um, they, um, they did not put this on their own infrastructure. So they put these documents out on the dark web as, as a troll, right? I see that as trolling everyone to go looking for this. And so I would have expected that they would have put this someplace on their own internal network uh, where no one should be able to find it with easy access, right? It's, it's not, we're, we're trying to make sure that only bad guys who have a persistent, engaging uh, desire to find this content can find it, not out on something that's indexed or someplace where they can just download it. Thank you, Dr. Barr. I have nothing further. Cross-examination? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Dr. Barr, um, you testified that, for lack of a better term, the honeypot, which is what was used to entrap uh, people who might uh, people who might want to access information they're not otherwise authorized to receive was incorrectly walled off. Is yes. that correct? Um, your comments, you, you testified that it should be, um, that no one should have a legitimate interest in touching. Yeah. Can you explain that a bit further? Yeah, so um, you, it, typically it, it's, it's something that is, it's, it's secret, it's sensitive, it's something that like um, normal people just sort of wouldn't be interested in, in looking at sort of like tax returns or credit card statements that, or, or the secret recipe for Coca-Cola or the tax uh, or the corporate uh, filings that are about to come out or something else. Would, would it be fair to say that um, the location of the document downloaded by the plaintiff was in an area that no one should legitimately touch? No, I, uh, the, the dark web, I think there's a number of legitimate uses of the dark web. Um, uh, a lot of their journalists use it for anonymous uh, uh, information sharing. Um, so I think the dark web is, a, is, a, is a, an appropriate place. It's as easily accessible as the clear net. Um, it, yes, yes. Download a browser and go for it. Okay. Um, what type of, um, well, let me ask you a question about beacons. Are beacons dangerous? So beacons are not inherently dangerous, but you don't understand, you know, what happened with them, right? So is it a good guy who clicked on that or a bad guy who clicked on it? And so I think that they, uh, they do reveal certain information about the, uh, about the user. But they're not, they don't cause harm. They don't, um, you know, compromise a computer necessarily. Do, they they? Don't, so they don't compromise a the computer, they do admit uh, they do admit and, uh, the, the location of, they do actually cause some sort of execution on the, on the, on the, the defendant, the victim, the on the, pers on the person's on the computer. Side. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and, th and that it beacons out, but that's, uh, that's about it. Is that a standard operating procedure for um, deceptive um, adversary engagements? Absolutely, you can download such code from the internet. Uh, there are numerous uh, academic papers posted on the subject. So would you consider doll plans to be dangerous? in your expert opinion, this content? I, so if they had put this on their, so dangerous in what way? So dangerous I, to the plane, dangerous to a child who's 13 years old. Well, I think it's, it is, so a 13 year old girl is interested in, I, we're gonna say that they're interested in dolls, like I'm just gonna, <laughs> for the okay. sake of the case, we're gonna okay. say that. <laughs> but yes, I would assume that a 13 year girl, old girl, girl who is doing a report for school would wanna go out and find this information. Would it be fair to say that, uh, that Ms. Bingham's technology sophistication was sufficiently advanced to enable to traverse the dark web? 
I think that's complicated. I think that, you know. You're the expert. Uh, you don't need technical sophistication. So, is that the answer I'm supposed to get? <laughs> <laughs> So if I took, so if I took a 13-year-old child right now and said, go to the dark web and download um, you know, these plans, that 13-year-old child would just be able to just pop? I think so. Very short order, just be able to go out and Google how to access the dark web. And oh, do so that. there would have to be steps made before you do yes, that. Yes, yes. It's not, right. it's not I I implicitly easy. How about that? Yeah. So, um, so Ms. the plaintiff didn't download these documents from the um, from Dolls R Us website, no. did she? No, she did not. Right, so how is it that, the, that your claim about Dolls RS's network have any connection to the fact that she, that Ms. Bingham downloaded them from somewhere else? So I think at that point you're making, that Dolls R Us made them publicly accessible to everyone. And I think they, they made them, they made them available to anyone on the dark web. And so at that point they were putting that out there for people to find. You're saying no? <laughs> I'm saying no. Ask me. Yeah, I will. I will. I will. All right. Um, so, but isn't downloading files from the dark web inherently risky? In a general sense. I, I think it can be, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of bad, the, the dark, the, they call it the dark web for a reason. There's a lot of bad stuff there, and, it's, and it can be, yeah. Thank you. No further questions. All right. Uh, so I think that the witness is excused. Thank you. Um, are you ready to call your, uh, is Dalzarus ready to call your expert witness? I think, turn? Yes, your turn. Mr. Tuffler. Mr. Kesterson, would you please state your credentials? We know your name already. Uh, my credentials, CISSP. They made me a vice president. That's credentials enough. Okay, um, so dolls are deployed in adversary engagement methods to trap malicious actors um, into thinking that they were stealing valuable intellectual property, is that correct? Yes, we, we, we'd looked at both the NIST documents in this area and the MITRE documents in this area and determined that this was a way to elevate our security strengths. Um, and. Um, how, to your knowledge, did the, uh, the honeypot documents, for lack of a better term, wind up outside of the network? Well, it's interesting because I, I heard the expert basically said we chose to publish them on the dark web, and we did no such thing. Uh, we built a thing that looked like it was part of our system. Okay, it looked like it was part of Dolls R Us. Uh, we, uh, in other words, honeypots, deceptive, de deceptive techniques. We. We loaded it up with uh, documents that we thought might uh, attract. I mean, the interesting thing is, you know, we, we're a doll company. So if we're going to make fake documents, they should be fake documents about dolls. And, uh, and so not, not, not nuclear weapons or anything. And uh, we, uh, uh, we put them on our, on, on our own site. Uh, and, and it was, we met the experts criteria that, it was away from where, where our staff is doing their work, so our staff wouldn't be touching them or anything. In fact, the only people who could touch them would be someone who actually accessed that network, and none of our own root users would do that. And so we didn't publish them on the dark web. We didn't post them on the dark web. We put them on our servers, and some nefarious never-do-well basically attacked us. I'm not saying that's Susie Bingham. That's not, that's not what we're saying at all. She, she, we, we agree, she is not the person who attacked our system. She is not the person who exfiltrated, exfiltrated the stuff from our system. She just happened to be the person who read the stuff on our system from, that someone else had stolen our system. So some hacker attacked us and put our stuff on his stuff in the dark web. She stumbled onto it and, and she opened the document. Uh, we couldn't determine that. As far as we knew, when that document was opened, it was opened by someone. It, it gave us a clue as to where the document was. And unfortunately, that clue was never more. We informed law enforcement, and they did the thing they did. Uh, were, were there precautions in place to make sure innocent users didn't access the, uh, the honeypot? There it was no normal customer interface. There was no web interfaces. There was no customers come and connect to us. In other words, the only people who would be going into that area would be someone who broke, who broke our purposely weak security to do so. 
And is having purposely weak security for this purpose standard in the, uh, in the security industry? Uh, it is, in fact, a, a pillar of the deceptive technique that you, if you create an area, a honeypot for them to go to, you, 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 you've, got to, you've got to make them think it's protected, but perhaps not as well as it should be. So yes. In, in your opinion, would, would it have been reasonable for Dolls R Us to foresee that a 13-year-old computer child prodigy would, um, in, pro, in, in violation of her prohibitions, her school code prohibitions, attempt to access this information that was, um, that was placed behind an admittedly weak security infrastructure, but a security infrastructure nonetheless. Well, it would be our opinion if a 13-year-old girl broke into our system she had to do this stuff, she'd be performing a criminal act. Okay, so um, again, in your opinion, is researching and downloading documents from the dark web inherently risky, even by professionals? Uh, well, I think anytime you open something that is uh, of unknown provenance, uh, you take a risk. You have to be very careful. In your opinion, um, was, um, was Ms. Bingham's act reckless? Say again? Were, were Susie Bingham's acts in attempting, in accessing um, the network reckless? Uh, I can't judge that. I'm not her parent. I'm not her teacher. I, I can understand a 13-year-old girl stumbling onto a, uh, what appears to be something very interesting and opening it. But again, I, again, I'm not her parent. I'm not her teacher. Okay. No further questions, Your Honor. All right. Cross-examination. Mr. Kesterson, you're Dolls R Us' uh, VP of Information Services, correct? That is correct. And Dolls R Us sells dolls and toys directed to children, is that correct? Uh, that is our business. You oversee the company's information security program, correct? That is true. And one of the strategies Dolls R Us employs is the use of adversary engagement or tainting to stop malicious actors, is that correct? That's true. And when Dolls R Us uses these techniques, adversary engagement, they intend to identify only malicious actors, correct? Uh, well, uh, the intent is to distract people from attacking our real resources. That's what we were after. And when you refer to people, the people you're trying to distract are malicious users or malicious actors, correct? That would be correct. In your opinion, is Susie Bingham a malicious actor? Uh, well, I don't think my opinion matters here, but she's not the person who attacked our network. And she wasn't who Dolls R Us intended to stop, is she? Uh, well, no. She was, she, I, I will agree that uh, she is a second-order victim. Mr. Kesterson, with respect to the specific plan at issue here, the 2024 Product and Marketing Plan for Dolls, in your role as Vice President of Information Services, did you run this adversary engagement or tainting plan by any lawyers before it went live? Our company of counsel was aware that we were going to use deception as an additional security technique, but she was not involved in the details of that. She was not informed of the details of it. She was not informed of what documents were created. Why not? Uh, she didn't ask. Mr. Kesterson, were you at all concerned that Dolls R Us, in using this adversary engagement or tainting approach with this hoax 2024 product plan, was knowingly putting materially false information about the company in a place with, as you say, weak security that made the document publicly accessible? Well, our, our thought on this is that we were not publishing the document. We were not providing it to the public. And in fact, our thought was the only people who would see this would be criminals who would be distracted. Uh, uh, this, uh, this was an unforeseen uh, event in our opinion, not in our plan. Mr. Kesterson, you understand we're here today because my client, Susie Bingham, was able to easily access a document that Dolls R Us posted to its network accessible via the dark web, correct? That's correct. And I believe you said that document was made available purposely with weak security. Is that correct? That's correct. Not to Susie Bingham, but to whoever would attack our system. 
Would you agree that a 13-year-old child might be very interested in the hoax document that Dolls R Us made available, this phony 2024 product plan? The 13-year-old child is our intended customer. Dolls R Us made it easy for Susie Bingham to access the fake plan document, didn't she? Didn't, didn't it? You have to say that again, I'm sorry. Dolls R Us made it easy to access this hoax plan, didn't it? Well, Dolls R Us didn't make it easy to access because we put security in place. We made it relatively easy to access to attackers because it would have vulnerabilities in it that would do it. So it would take a knowledgeable attacker. And we purposely have to make the attacker think he's attacking a real system. If it was just up there with no security, they would be very suspicious. So you put up just enough resistance to make them think you're guarding something valuable, and yet just enough weakness that they think, oh, aren't they clever? They got it. And that's what we did. So weak enough that a 13-year-old child could penetrate the security in place. Now, I doubt the 13-year-old child would find the vulnerability to break into Dolls R Us, but the person who put it on the dark web apparently didn't bother to protect it at all. And to the best of your knowledge, there were no warnings whatsoever that put my client Susie on notice that she should not download the document. Well, that would be a deal with her parents and her teacher. But I'm talking with respect to Dolls R Us. Dolls R Us did not provide any marking, any warning whatsoever to put her on notice that she should not download the document. Uh, no, in fact, we needed to make the document look normal and attractive to a thief. Thank you, Mr. Kesterson. I have nothing further. All right, so the witnesses are, uh, the witness is excused. So that is the end of our testimony from the experts, and we're now going to hear closing arguments from the lawyers. Uh, Ms. Madigan, the floor is yours. And we're doing just fine on time. You guys did okay, a great, great job on time. Ladies and gentlemen, now you've heard all of the evidence, and my client, the plaintiff, bears the burden of proof to, to prove it was more likely than not the Dolls R Us failed to use reasonable care when employing the data security methods and techniques at issue today. We've clearly met that burden. You've heard from Dr. Barr, who's testified that Dolls R Us did not meet the minimum standard of care. It's fine to use adversary techniques in your data security to attract malicious actors, but with that comes responsibility much like putting a fence around a swimming pool because you could attract unintended individuals and cause harm. We've heard from Dr. Barr that Dolls R Us failed to do so. We've also heard from Mr. Kesterson, who's very knowledgeable, backs up Dolls R Us's data security plan. What you also heard him say was that my client Susie was not an intended audience. And while there was some security in place to prevent harm like what we're here about today, those protections were deliberately easy to break, like a fence that wasn't locked securely. And so as you go back to the jury room and have to decide who's responsible, is there any liability, and what should be done, I ask you to think about a 13-year-old child and what sort of protection should be in place to prevent a scholarship student from being tricked into downloading a document and then being expelled from her private school and derailing her education in an act that caused no harm to anyone and was instead a faulty implementation of data security by a large company that specifically markets to children and should have known better. Thank you very much. Okay. Mr. Tepler. Ladies and gentlemen, let's, let's be clear about what, what actually happened here. What actually happened here was that a child who is very, very knowledgeable about computer security wound up downloading information, contents, from a party other than Dolls R Us. You know, the Dolls R Us site, the honeypot was set up in accordance with, as Mr. Kesterson has testified, and actually as Dr. Barr has, has conceded, was standard operating procedure. Yes, it was made a little bit easier to access, but that's not, uh, you know, the, the honeypot was a little bit easier to access, but that was by the threat actor, that was by the criminal. By the time that this information had been accessed and published by a third party on, on the web, um, my client had nothing further to do with it, and there, there is no way that you could foresee that um, a 13-year-old child downloading something that someone else had stolen 
right? When, in fact, that child had actually acted, having noticed that it was a prohibited act, in fact, the specific act of downloading information from the dark web was prohibited by the honor code of the school. If Susie Bingham has a problem, she has a problem with the school and not with Dolls R Us. Thank you very much. All right, so, um, so now we're going to, I'm gonna do a little, uh, you, the lawyers addressed you as if you were a jury. I'm gonna keep that for a little bit, but we're gonna switch to a different model. What I'm gonna do is tell you, because uh, I, um, <laughs> a jury's uh, give an answer, and that's all that they do. They don't say why. Um, and so what we're going to do is so I'm gonna tell you again what the jury instruction is a little bit um, slower. But then I'm going to switch and pretend that at the last minute, due to an unforeseen event, we no longer have the six jurors available to decide. You need a minimum of six in the civil side. Uh, usually we seat eight, we lost three. The lawyers have decided that I will decide the case. And so what I'm gonna do, and then I'm going to enlist you as my law clerk. So I'm gonna tell you what a law clerk is. A law clerk is a lawyer. Uh, because I'm not technical, I'm a liberal arts type person, I make sure to hire clerks with substantial technical expertise. And so I'm gonna ask you in a minute what you think the answer should be, because I'm gonna to have to rule at the end about whether Dolls Are Us is responsible for Susie's being expelled from Nevermore Academy. Um, by the way, did you, did you guys watch, what, did you watch Wednesday? The new, the new Netflix show. I, mean, that, I was like, never more. I love that show. It's such a great show. Okay. Um, so, so here's the jury instruction. I'm going to sort of break it down for you a little bit. Negligence. We all know what negligence is, right? You're driving your car. You don't look where you're going, and you sideswipe another car. Uh, you know if you rear-end somebody, you're almost always responsible. So we, we all have an idea of what negligence is. But I'm going to read you the jury instruction. Um, so so what we what the plaintiff... The plaintiff has the burden of proof, right? 51%. Uh, it's not uh, beyond a reasonable doubt. It's a preponderance, a little. The plaintiff has the burden of proof to show that Dolls R Us was negligent, that, uh, that, the, uh, that Susie was harmed, and that Dolls R Us's negligence was a substantial factor in harming Susie. And what's Susie's harm? She was expelled because she violated her school's code that she was not supposed to download things to the school system without her advisor's permission. And her advisor reminded her of that when she undertook this term paper that she was writing, and what, which was the reason she downloaded this document from the dark web. She was writing a term paper on the dark web. Um, then I, I told you this, the basic standard of care, just gonna look at my timer, we're doing fine, um, is the failure to use reasonable care to prevent harm to oneself or to others. A person can be negligent by acting or failing to act. A person is negligent if that person does something that a reasonably careful person would not do in the same situation or fails to do something that a reasonably prudent person, a uh, reasonably careful person would do in the same situation. So as a jurors, but now it's for me to decide, I have to decide whether, how, a reasonably careful person would have acted in the context of Dolls R Us. So there's the question. I'll give you a, a couple little points. Uh, th these are my legal points. Um, we first met when I spoke at one of your classes, so it's another, another one of um, these kinds of things. Um, I always say that uh, uh, every case is about um, uh, whether someone did their job. Uh, that's true of Susie. Did she do her job by not following the rules of conduct? Um, did Dolls R Us, and that's called comparative fault, right? So Susie can be partly negligent, and, and so can Dolls R Us. A jury would l quite literally assign percentages of fault. Um, so that's one thing to keep in mind. Did everybody do their job? Um, uh, and, and I will tell you this, that, um, and, and sometimes, and then analyzing whether someone did their job or not, you look to prevailing standards. I'll give you an example of, because I know it better than the privacy, that, 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 that the uh, internal, that the, the rules that people follow in setting up systems to attract attackers like this, there are usually rules, standards of care, best practices, those can define 
how you do your job, right? So that's the, so that's a, and, and think about a doctor, right? So that's the standards of care, how a doctor does her job. Okay, so now I have to decide this and I am puzzled. And I am very curious about what you, my brilliant law clerks, think about whether Dolls Are Us is responsible through its practices of setting up this honeypot uh, that an attacker got into the system, took the documents, Susie found them, downloaded them into her school system, triggering a beacon that resulted in the FBI's getting a search warrant authorized by a judge based on a finding of probable cause that a crime had been committed. And can you imagine what that was like for, for the search warrant being executed at Nevermore Academy? And ultimately leading to Susie's being expelled. What's at issue in this lawsuit is, is Dolls Are Us responsible? So I would like to invite you to tell me what you think. Okay, yes. Yes, well, yes. So I have a clarifying question and then a question. So clarifying question is, Susie did not actually access the company network in no, any way. A, 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 hacker, a hacker got in, okay. got Somebody the document, got it, put, put it on a repository. She yeah. accessed the door. Okay. The other question I have is, did Susie have a verbal agreement with her teacher in school, or was there a written agreement that she signed to say? I think the record is silent on that point. But I do know that the school's honor, I will tell you this. Honor codes and rules of conduct are reduced to writing, and students get them. That is typical. You can't and the facts, you, yeah. You can't just ask the question. How would you rule? I oh, know. Yeah, so let me just finish answering the question, and then, then he'll give you. You'll give us your opinion whether you th think Dolls R Us is responsible. And Susie's advisor reminded her. So the fact, I think the record is undisputed that there were rules. She knew the rules, and she didn't follow the rules. So uh, there is comparative fault to be assigned. The issue is, what do you think? Is Dolls R Us responsible? And if so, what percent? <laughs> and why? Tick tock, tick tock. Oh, no, 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 we're, we're doing fine. <laughs> I would say that she definitely violated the rules. Just rule, don't justify, just rule. Don't justify. <laughs> just rule. Yes. Oh, you can tell me oh, why. So you, she, yeah, she, violated, she violated the rule, yeah. rules of conduct. Yeah. So she yeah. violated the rules. Schools but what about Dolls R Us? Is Dolls R Us responsible? If, if, okay, let, let me say it like this. If. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no, no. I can't rule say and why. Rule and why. Yes, they're responsible. Who's the judge here? Okay. I'm the judge here. <laughs> right, right? Yes, they're responsible for a certain percentage. I don't know what percentage. Because. They put documents on their own network Percentage. that were not as secure as they should have been, and because of that, they were wound up in a location where Susie was able to access them. Now, she is also potentially partially at fault because she violated the school rules. Is that? Okay, great, thanks, that's great. All right, so let's, let's hear from somebody else. Good afternoon, Chantel from Capital One. Um, I would say that my opinion is that Dolls and Co is not liable with the large majority with the clarification of placement, right? Because I heard the dark web is accessible by everyone, but then earlier you said on your own internal network, it can't be where anyone can get to it. So they basically, they did set up a, a you know, essentially a firewall. They had security, but it was, they, it's, it's, it's a honey trap, right? They were luring people into their system to trap them, get them when they took the documents. And so somebody else, bad, bad hacker, <laughs> right. stole the documents, including this one, put them on their own repository on the web, and Susie found the document, downloaded it, triggering the beacon and the search warrant. So I, I understand that, but if the placement and the internal network has a perception of this is my network, my folder of taxes, Rule no one should get to reason, it. <laughs> Rule and reason. Rule and reason. So basically, the, the attacker got the documents. They intended the attacker to get documents, right? right? It was so Anipod. Dolls and Co, not guilty. Not guilty, excellent. There we go. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, next, we'll go back and forth. Uh, Your Honor, uh, yes. I'm going to assume that we have uh, on the record the communications between uh, Toys R Us and law enforcement, obviously. Yes. And I'm going to just, I'm reading them right now, and uh, we have, uh, I'm sorry, what's your character's name? Uh, <laughs> oh. 
There, are, there, there, there. Yeah, uh, sorry, the, so the, yeah. Yeah, so the, and we see the, <laughs> the, the chief officer uh, claiming confidently that uh, they were looking at the hacker from this IP address, and uh, that caused what you could call an overreaction from law enforcement, but these technical people seemed very confident in their, asse in their assessment that the person at the other end of that computer was uh, the hacker. And that's what caused uh, the fallout. If they had instead communicated with CARE and explained that we're not sure, that document was opened over there, but let's not barge in with the, uh, the, uh, the men in black kind of uh, kind of setup, uh, then that would have been. So the you're first saying question. you're saying that Toys R Us did not or Dolls R Us did not do its job Correct. because they were sloppy, and if they had done their job, then that this if harm would not have happened to. The Susie. communication with law enforcement should have been done with more care. That's a very nuanced legal analysis. Thank you. That's good. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Again, that's, that's good. Like that's the whole, but that's exactly that was that's how a lawyer thinks, right? Yeah. That was good. All so right. I was gonna, um, I was saying that I was go with the, the uh, against the plaintiff on this because even their own witness said that if they had put it on their own network and not dark web, and then they, under testimony said they actually put it on their network. So their, well, their, own, their expert, their expert did. Their yeah. own expert <laughs> said if they had put it on their own network, it would have been fine, and that's what they did. Yep. Um, but I also was. Thing, what he said You're saying the plaintiff did not meet her right, burden of proof. Right. right. And they did not do, I also think they did not do enough to protect the other end of it. Like, why wasn't there a tracker on when it was moved instead of opened? That type of thing. Mm -hmm. All right. Excellent. Okay. So, uh, Dolls R Us was slightly negligent, but there was no uh, causation established as to her actual damages. So, I would rule in favor of the defendant. Okay. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you Ben. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so clarifying question, what was the outcome of Bingham versus Nevermore when the parents sued the school? Oh, well, um, that's a great <laughs> question. <laughs> I think the record's good. silent on that, but mm -hmm. um, that's, it's a great question because that's comparative fault yeah. as well. 100%. So at, on your verdict form as a jury, you would be able to assign comparative fault to the empty seat defendant. One might surmise that Nevermore is not here and that probably they settled the case. Yeah, we, we have 50 minutes. That's why we don't bring in another party. Yeah, but, but that was, that was a great <laughs> question. That's a great clarifying question. So you can apportion fault to Nevermore as well. So Dolls R Us are, are not liable for the outcome because the outcome was applied by the school and it may have not been proportional to the offense committed by the child. Not foreseeable is the way a lawyer would put it. Yeah. Excellent. All right, good. All right, excellent. Yeah, I think I too vote for the defendant here. I think the real attractive nuisance was the dark web and not the document. Mm -hmm. So the school made a huge mistake when they made the dark web available to a 13-year-old. And second, I really think that <laughs> the Dolls R Us has demonstrated that they were not negligent. They have a duty to protect the real documents. And the very existence of the fake documents shows that they were taking unusual steps to protect the real documents. So because the school allowed the student to, uh, to, to go to the dark web, I think that was really the root of the problem. Okay, excellent. Amen. Uh, I, I would have to rule uh, in oh, uh, minute, favor please. of the defendant here. Uh, basically, it seems that um, it, it was foreseeable that the document would end up on the dark web as the entire intent of it was to, um, uh, you know, essentially honeypot a attack to get that exfiltrated to the dark web. However, it's not reasonably foreseeable that a 13-year-old girl would have the technolog technological skills to access the dark web, despite the the somewhat uh, nebulous testimony of the the expert. Um, <laughs> nebulous. So you're nebulous. I, and I, I would further. I, I would they, further. They say that at work too. <laughs> You know, I'd further note, I was, Cloudy I, I was surprised that the defense counsel did not uh, try and put an assumption of risk on uh, the plaintiff. Uh, she, should have, she should have reasonably known that the risk of her opening that document was her expulsion, regardless of an FBI raid. All right, we're, 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 we're just about at time. So, um, I, would, I would end there. Okay, good. So I think we have, I have, I have 31 seconds left on my timer, although I just got the timer. So, um, so quick, 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 and then I'll tell you my, uh, my verdict. I'd recommend the court look at a negligence per se theory, uh, the placement of the beacon in a document uh, that they knowingly know could end up on the dark web, could constitute uh, under federal law a CFA violation, and perhaps the same under state law, which could bring negligence per se. Wow, okay, good, good, yeah. <laughs>
clerk, I would call your attention to the amicus brief of the DHS CISA, which is encouraging companies like uh, Dolls R Us to take these measures, and it's an early stage of this uh, application, and n not everyone's going to get it perfect, and you should find Thank for you. the defendant. All right, so with, with seven <laughs> seconds left, verdict for the defendant in favor of, uh, in favor of Dolls R Us. Uh, plaintiff did not prove her case. Okay, thanks everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.